Um, do you recommend any drugs for prevention of Alzheimer's, cancer, or heart disease? And then I guess the same question, what do you do? If, do you recommend drugs if someone already has Alzheimer's, cancer, or heart disease? And you yeah, could include, talking. and you so, could do this for heart, for heart disease and Alzheimer's and cancer, and you could talk about statins as well. With respect to Alzheimer's, we don't recommend any drugs for prevention. Uh, and, and I think in the long run, it's possible that the, a pro, in a precision medicine approach we've taken, which addresses these different factors, will include drugs. And I think that's the, going to be the optimal way in the future. But right now, uh, the Aricept, Namenda, the things that are being used, um, have a minimal, minimal effect and can have some fairly negative side effects. So we use these uh, quite judiciously. And I guess you guys can also answer that question for heart disease. Do you recommend anything for, for prevention of heart disease? And what do you recommend if someone does have heart disease? So for the very high risk people, we do recommend statins, but this, this area is changing and it's changing in two different ways. One is the PCSK9 inhibitors are becoming a little bit more popular, a little less expensive. Um, they seem to be tolerated better than statins. And uh, they don't raise LP little a, which uh, statins can do you know, by up to 30%. Um, so the next issue though, but, but the statins do have a wonderful track record for prevention in the high risk people, including secondary prevention. Um, so I would say that there's another, you know, uh, you know, keep your, you know, nose to the grindstone or uh, ear to the ground, I should say, uh, about the PCSK9 inhibitor out of Norway. I never mentioned brand name, so I'm not going to now. Um, uh, but once the FDA is able to get in there and inspect that facility, um, you'll have a PCSK9 inhibitor that will be injected twice per year. And that'll wow. probably throw away all the statins, I would think. The other side of it is the diabetes drugs. And this is really something that I'm hoping every cardiologist is paying attention to. Uh, and that is the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 uh, agonists. These are like coming at us like a comet out of the sky. All of a sudden, they have cardiovascular outcomes of improvement of heart failure. There was a, a, an FDA approval yesterday for pre prevention of progression of chronic kidney disease uh, with one of them and um, uh, heart attack, stroke, and death. And these, you see them on television, so I don't need to name any names, but these uh, drugs are uh, really amazing and it's really uh, game changer for people practicing cardiology who have not just high risk people, but people <laughs> with active disease um, who have, and it, it, it seems to not matter whether the person is diabetic or not, uh, that they end up with these dramatic improvements in outcome. Um, so all of this is still being studied with multiple drugs. And we're going to, I think, see a sea change over the next three to five years that if you are doing drug management, those drugs are probably going to change and include one of these used to be diabetes drugs. Now they're heart disease drugs. Love to hear Joel's, either Joel's comment on this, but. Yeah, you know, you, nobody can summarize it better than you. Um, you know, aspirin when appropriate, but we also know aspirin when not appropriate is a harm, but calcium scores that are high in coronary disease, uh, but it's certainly not for everybody and probably a whole food plant-based and, Diets, all four of us would agree upon. I have some uh, slight uh, platelet anti-aggregate effect. Um, you know, I, I always love coenzyme Q10. It's the forgotten little portion of our Krebs cycle. It declines after age 40. It declines dramatically if you're on a statin. We've got a couple of heart failure and longevity trials from international and from Sweden. So I throw that out there. It's pretty inexpensive and uh, but certainly not to the level of tens of thousands of people in studies. At some point, Steve Shore, because there's a chance to bring up extra virgin olive oil, I think it might be interesting before Dale leaves because you know, the plant-based community has had you know, one perspective. Some of the most recent science and cognitive impairment has another perspective, uh, but you know, I'll just fish you that for later on. You could go ahead with that. Dale has left the left. So you go ahead with what you wanted to say about extra virgin olive oil. Uh, you know, because there's now two or three randomized studies in mild cognitive impairment about, you know, higher doses of extra virgin olive oil. I think the Predimed study had a sub-study on, 
you know, cognitive impairment, extra virgin olive oil. Obviously, I'm from the tradition of a fan of Dr. Furman, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, Mr. Pritikin, Dr. Ornish, where for, you know, reversal studies, oils in general were, uh, you know, largely recommended to be avoided or completely avoided. Uh, they know SOS, salt oil, sugar diet. And I think, you know, when we're talking about soybean oil, corn oil, um, some of the poor quality industrial oils, that's probably reasonable. I don't know. I'm still split, you know, between Robert Vogel's study on endothelial function. And there's one other like it showing some detriment in healthy volunteers. But, you know, from Spain, there was an 800 patient coronary disease study uh, last year where they did unbelievable markers of endothelial performance. Uh, including this endothelial dust and endothelial progenitor cells and uh, brachial forearm flow media dilatation and a large amount of extra virgin olive oil actually was largely a benefit. Now, maybe you should just eat an olive instead of the oil and get the fiber and the full spectrum of nutrients. Maybe you should have a lyophilized capsule of an olive that really is devoid of any uh, high fat content, but uh, if Dale were around, I think his program, you know, endorses extra virgin olive oil. It still remains one of those points that splits the plant-based medical community quite a bit. So I'll be quiet and throw it up to the rest. Well, I don't see why there any nutritional scientist has a controversy in knowing that and thinking just inherently that a walnut is better than walnut oil and a sesame seed is better than sesame oil and that a hemp seed is better than hemp seed oil. Because when you eat the whole food, you're not just ingesting lignans and phytochemicals and fibers. You're also getting nutrient fulfillment that reduces your apostat. And, and also these whole plant foods that are, contain the fats contain sterols and stanols that bind LDL in the digestive tract and have cholesterol moving from the bloodstream into the, into the stool. What I'm saying is there's a host of different mechanisms via which the right type of fat in the diet increases absorption of phytochemicals and beneficial nutrients. And, and that getting your fat from a whole food like a walnut or a sun-dried olive or you know, using a whole food like that, there's other benefits you get to protect against cancer as well. So what I'm saying, you might see a short-term benefit from some anti-inflammatory effect of olive oil, but it's not going to have long-term, the extra olive oil is going to stop fat loss from the body because oil is such a concentrated fat source. It's absorbed so rapidly. It revs up fat storage biomechanisms and inhibits the rate at which you're losing fat from your body. So if you're a very slim person with a BMI of 19 and you're working eight hours a day behind a plow in a field and you're a physical labor with hardly no body fat, probably I have no strong admonition against that. But since the average American is already consuming between 400 and 600 calories from oil a day, and the average American is grossly overweight, even the people are, who are thinner overweight have too much fat on their body. It's don't forget, it's only 2.4% of Americans that have a BMI below 23 because they exercise and they eat right. The rest of them are thin because they're alcoholics or, or smokers, or they have some disease keeping them thin. The 10% of the population has a BMI below 23. The majority of those are sick people. They didn't. So what I'm saying right now is that it's, it's the logic and the science seems to generate the fact that sticking to your your fat consumption coming from a whole food, because when you process it to an oil, it interferes with fat loss. And fat, law, and fat on the body is such a strong disease promoter that anything that may, prevents you from losing weight can't be overall ideal. So we have to put this in conjunction with getting adequate fat for maximized phytochemical absorption and adequate fat to stabilize heart arrhythmia and adequate fat and sterols and stanols and lignans to have the anti-cancer effects that those foods have without getting excess calories. And you can't do both. You can't have enough of the sterols and stanols and lignans and beneficial effects from walnuts and all these particular seeds and still have the caloric room in your daily pie to put a lot of to put oil in too because your calories then be over your, over your caloric requirements. You can't do both the oil and the nuts. And clearly even the Prevament study showed that when people got some benefit from even olive oil, when they switched to nuts, the benefits were more intense and more severe, reduction, further reduction in heart attack rates. So that's why I'm an advocate where your source of fat comes from the whole nut, not from the oil, mostly because the people just don't successfully lose weight until they get the oil out. Thank you. 
Um, I want to comment, uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Kahn. Um, you had mentioned about the possibility of uh, great new medical drugs in the future or possibly now. Um, you know, one of the, the things that some of our audience members are grappling with is that there's been a lot of information. There was a guy named Ben Goldacre, and he wrote a book called Bad, Bad Pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A. And he went on and on and on explaining how a pharmaceutical drug, a pharmaceutical company can do 25 trials and show you only the two that came out good. And the question is, when you get excited or feel good about a, a, pharma, a, a, drug, um, a drug result, a prescription drug result, how do we know that it's unbiased, accurate, honest information and not a minute, we're not being manipulated where they had 20 trials, they threw out the 18, they kept the two, they stopped it after six weeks and didn't see what happened five years later. Like, I don't, I want to be open. I don't want to be only believe in natural stuff. I want to be open and also hear the best of modern medicine. But at the same time, these companies have been fined so many times. They're, you know, according to this book, they're completely doing everything they can to get the clinical trials to look favorable. So when you see a favorable clinical trial, how do you say, okay, this is great versus say, how do I know that this was the one out of 20 that they showed me and didn't show me the other 19? So let me take that one on um, yeah. just because I, I have been a, a vocal advocate against the pharmaceutical industry and it's totally about the pricing uh, and profit margins and the fact that we pay more in this country for drugs than any other uh, developed country. They all have price controls and we don't. Uh, there's only two developed countries that don't. That's us in New Zealand and New Zealand does so much with Australia that the prices are very similar um, and, and Australia has price controls. And, but the issue that you're bringing up is an older issue. In my career, there have been a handful of drug withdrawals because they didn't do their job of finding out that cerivastatin that was, uh, would actually um, kill people with rhabdomyolysis if you mixed it with gemfibrozil. It only happened 35 times, but they pulled that drug off the market and it cost them dearly. Now, and you know, going back even further, remember, you know, uh, the best diuretic ever, Celecrin. It was going to stop you from ever having to worry about uric acid. Well, all that uric acuria ended up with kidney stones and people getting into a lot. I mean, so they pulled that one off the market. So let me tell you, it's not in the drug company's best interest to do pseudoscience on a 10,000 people and then apply it to a few million and get the lawsuits and everything else. So it still happens, but it, it happens very rarely. It's, there's, there's two double checks, not just the fact that the consumers and the lawyers are gonna hold their feet to the fire, that's, that's one. But I'd say the stronger one is the FDA's entire job. Now you can argue about the FDA. I know there are people, particularly on the industry side, who think that they are too slow and they're too restrictive and we have diseases to cure and these folks have a drug and they won't approve it. And you know the manufacturing thing in uh, inspection in Norway for Enclizeran, people are pulling their hair out. So why can't we have this drug? Well, you know, ever since the litamide was stopped by the FDA, and we didn't have those flipper babies in the United States. The FDA has really put it taken, I mean, they were always doing it, but it, they sort of upregulated the level that you have to do to get through. And so they've denied a lot of drugs uh, and maybe some of those drugs would have been helpful and some of them could be dangerous. But the one thing that the, that book was not talking about is clinicaltrials.gov. It is relatively new, and so it may not have, have applied to the older studies. Uh, I do, I have heard this over and over again, but usually it's about, <clears throat> um, you know, sort of industry uh, folks, uh, not so much pharmaceuticals. When you do a large randomized trial for FDA approval, you have to register that thing. And, and you have, in order to get, you have to put in an, an NDA, a new drug application, get the FDA to approve the trial, and then you can't hide the results. In the, in the past, you really could, but that shouldn't happen anymore. If it does, I'd like to know, uh, just because, you know, again, because of my anti-pharma bias based on the money, uh, 
I would love to have some more things to, <laughs> to talk about other than the money. So please tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong about that, if I've got my head in the sand. Uh, but I think uh, their, whole, their feet are being held to the fire in several different directions. And I don't expect that we're gonna have a bunch of dangerous drugs that are hurting people. You're always going to find something. The biggest exception I can say uh, is the last um, two weeks, finding out that uh, the incidence of um, COVID, not just illness, which is what the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were actually approved for. Not, they, and they were 94.5 and 95% effective at, of, at decreasing severe illness. Then you find out that that was on like 40,000 people. And then you do it in millions and you find out that the infection rate, not just illness, but infection rate is 0.04%. I've never seen that. I, it, all, it usually goes the other way around. You do your trial, you get your results, and then you apply it to real world and it's worse. This time it's, it's different. So I think they're doing it right. And uh, I still am sh shocked um, that uh, there, there was an article yesterday about 5,800 people having uh, COVID illness. Some of them did pass away, 74 uh, people, and specifically out of the 5,800 uh, after the vaccination. But this was in the context of like 96 million people in, in an active pandemic. So I, I what I'm saying is that I think that the checks and balances that we have against my least favorite industry that uh, says that safety is good, money, that's a totally different topic. Don't get me started. Yeah. I'll just shoot in, you know, uh, Kim, you may not know this. I'm, my little tiny clinic in Detroit, we're involved with the same company that makes Inclycerin, but we're doing the Pellicarsin randomized study for lipoprotein A. It's my first really big drug trial in a long time. I have no love for pharmaceutical companies. I have no love. But the rigor with which we have to go through to enroll one person and the monitoring and the paperwork, I mean, it's what drives drug costs up insanely, but um, it's not fun to do drug trials uh, and you really need a whole team. The other part is the post-release follow-up. And you know, we learn things. We're learning about vaccinations. Well, you know, for example, the body of a uh, drug called fluoroquinolone antibiotics. I mean, years ago, it was reported that uh, these are like Cipro and Levaquin. I mean, very common, but that they might be associated with uh, Achilles tendon rupture. But now in our field, Dr. Williams and I, you know, aortic uh, enlargement, aortic aneurysms, maybe mitral valve disease uh, related to collagen interruption. So a drug that's out still needs active surveillance, still needs communication with the public about the risk. If you have a large aorta, you may be better off not treating your urinary tract infection with Cipro. And, you know, but that's a whole nother level of educating you know, your patient population and the public about new data. So you, know, you, you have to keep the surveillance going long-term and you know, treat naturally what you can treat naturally. And Joel, you look like you got wise comments here. No, I'm nothing. Really, okay. I'm still just eating my wild blueberries, my scallions, and my different mushrooms. <laughs> different mushrooms. Hey, this is mushroom, my mushroom week. 45% 40, 40, reduction in cancer if you eat a variety of mushrooms during the week. Reported, in the last, reported in the last 10 days, but reported many other times too. Yeah. Mm -hmm.